for us, community energy is more than just about wind turbines. Um, uh, where it is about wind turbines, uh, it's about how inclusive that can be. Um, so that energy is not done to you, uh, it's done with you, um, touching on one of your points. So I'm going to run through a little bit about who we are as a, an organisation um, and then touch on some of the bits that we think are important when you're thinking about developing your, your projects uh, from the perspective of a national organisation and a funder. So our mission is to give all UK communities the opportunity to own and generate clean green power and energy reduction is a key part of that so it's not just about generation uh, we're also looking at demand reduction it's really important to take that into perspective a lot of the projects that we're seeing now are renewable energy projects and um, that's come about because of uh, financial incentives like the feed-in tariff where we should be starting is energy efficiency as uh, reducing the amount of energy that we're uh, consuming in the first place so we don't need to have that much generation so uh, it's bringing those two things together um, a little bit about us we've uh, been around for a number of years we've supported over a hundred groups in the space uh, uh, one of them in the room uh, with either support or finance so the funding that we've got is as that support groups to deliver projects uh, it comes in to help with capital raising, um, it can act like a share underwriting, it's there to help projects get over the line and to fund them. Um, we have uh, a network, network of corporates, some city firms you'll, you'll know about. Um, from those firms we've brokered in over uh, 12,000 hours of support and that's valued at over £2 million. And what has the support gone to go uh, towards? It's helping uh, groups to develop precedent-setting legal contracts. Um, it's helping projects get over the line. Um, and uh, over half a million people have uh, benefited from the projects that we've helped to support. Um, what else do we do? We, so we provide funding, we provide support. Um, we also uh, consult, so we advise people on how to approach community energy, how to model it. Uh, how to work out what the benefits are. Um, so I'll be touching on some of that in a second. Uh, and we also co-administer DEX Urban Community Energy Fund alongside Centre for Sustainable Energy. So uh, at the back end of last year, we got really excited. We'd been doing this for a while. We thought, how best do we really uh, support the sector to grow? So we set ourselves an ambitious target. Uh, that's to enable 500 megawatts of community energy, that is generation, um, by 2020. Uh, what does that look like? Well, that's enough energy to power all the homes in Bristol. Uh, it's ambitious for us um, because that's what we've helped enable to date. Um, so it's quite a, it's quite a big jump. Uh, it's the same trajectory for the, the sector as a whole. As a sector, we've, uh, uh, we've installed about 100 megawatts of installed capacity. It's taken us about 20 years to get there. We believe that through uh, policy measures, uh, such as shared ownership, we're going to see that double within the next 12 months. So community energy is going to be on the agenda of politicians, um, Treasury are going to be focusing on this. There's going to be a lot more scrutiny in how these projects are developed, what they're doing, who they're benefiting, uh, things like the feed-in tariff for up for review. They could look at that and say, well, who's it really benefiting? Um, if we can tell a good story, which goes back to your previous exercise, um, that's going to help us to secure these kind of support mechanisms to deliver more projects. So uh, just touching on again what, we've, what we're about and how we support the sector. So um, we're developing resources. Uh, one of the things we're doing is setting up a legal toolkit. So uh, taking all that expertise that we've channeled over the years to uh, put it to strategic use, instead of supporting individual projects, we want to support the sector. So we're developing template contracts. Um, heads of terms, lease agreements, PPA agreements, those sorts of things that you need to get your project over the line. But importantly, um, and this is uh, something that's different to how it's been done before, is looking at ultimately who's going to fund this. Some of these projects are quite big. They're going to be going to banks. Uh, you're going to be going to financial institutions. They're going to look at your documentation and say, and look at specific contracts, uh, sorry, uh, terms in the contracts. 
are the, are the right terms in there? Have they, have they been written the right way? Will they be able to fund these projects? Sometimes the answer is no, and it's important that that's built in from the beginning. It's, so it goes back to the previous points around uh, looking at uh, sort of the end of the project before you start. What are you really trying to get out of it? Um, we advise and we also provide finance, as I already mentioned. Um, so this is, uh, that's, that was the about us. This is a bit more around um, some of the things that we're seeing in the sector, some advice. Um, and it says it there. There's, we've seen over the years uh, a number of organizations who, uh, you know, they're strapped for cash. It's a, it's a, a lot of groups starting out volunteer-led organizations. Um, what's, what's the easiest way to try and deliver a project is to borrow uh, some documentation from your friends around the corner. Um, we've seen a couple of times uh, organizations that um, directors have you know, taken a contract and amended them without any legal support, any professional support. This is, this is not the way to do it. It's, uh, it's going to create risks for your investors. It's going to create risks all the way down the line. Um, in one particular case, a group ended up spending more money on legal costs trying to remedy the contract they did entered into than if they'd come to uh, a professional outfit in the first place to get them drawn up. So don't take shortcuts. It's really important that you get things right from the beginning. The other bit that we see as, as an organization that um, uh, funds some of these projects is, do you have the right team on board? So again, that was talked about previously. Who's on your board? Do you have the right skill set? Um, and are you able to deliver the project over the 20 life period of that project? So just as a, um, a, another way of looking at that is, you know, who, who's also on your board in terms of what they're trying to get out of it? Um, there's, it, quite rightly, you know, different people will be coming at this from a different angle. Uh, some people really love the environment. They really want to protect the environment. Uh, climate change is important to them. Others have the more social uh, perspective. They want to be able to deliver uh, benefits on the ground. Um, some people just like uh, uh, going and engaging at the political level. Um, you've got a real mixed bag often on your board, but what's really important are the skills and expertise. <laughs> you have to excuse me. Uh, <laughs> so um, so uh, drawing from the village people, um, uh, the, the <laughs> Uh, who's, who's on your board? What kind of skills and expertise do you have? So obviously, take this with a pinch of salt, but um, you're going to need someone who can look at your contracts, who can go through it. If you don't have that skill on board, can you draw on that resource externally? You know, is, is someone able to, to go through a contract and, and really negotiate with a commercial developer down to, um, you know, right from the beginning, working backwards from, say we're talking about a large-scale solar project, can you negotiate the development fee some of these large-scale projects, developers are walking away with a million pounds off the table that could have gone into community benefit. That's a lot of money. Do you have the commercial nous to be able to work that out? Do you know what to look for in a financial model? It's really important that you have the right people on your team. If you don't have them on your team, who can you turn to to get that sort of advice? There are plenty of organizations out there who can support you with this kind of work. Uh, some of them uh, have noticed that there is uh, a market here for them and there are people who will work at deferred fees, at risk or low bono. There's, there's ways you can access this kind of resource without paying city prices. Um, it's important that you get the right kind of advice at the right point in your project. So map it out, understand where you think you'll be needing that. Don't be afraid to ask uh, and, and cost it in. Um, I'll just touch on a couple other bits because um, sometimes you get a group that comes in with uh, you know someone who's really passionate about you know what can this achieve. Um, it's actually important to have a broad base of skill sets. So uh, you know you might have a bunch of technicians on the board, but can they engage with the community? So really do think about holistically uh, what you're trying to achieve from the project. Um, Again, as a funder, we see there's quite a lot of things that you need to pay attention to. Um, there's sort of a shopping list. I don't expect you to read through them, but uh, headlines are, you know, do you understand your risks? Um, 
Have you got the right team on board? Uh, ultimately, you know, the, sec the sector's growing. Um, to fund some of these projects, many groups will be going out doing a fundraise. It's going to be competition for that money. You've got platforms like Ethics, you know, you've got investors going through that. If one's offering 5% and the other one's offering 6% or two offering 6%, you know, who's on the board? Do you have someone who's got, uh, you know, you look at their CV and you think, right, this guy can really deliver. I'm not sure about the other one. There's going to be competition. As I mentioned previously, there's going to be a lot of focus from the likes of the FCA. This is going to get, um, it's going to be a hot topic politically. Um, it's going to require groups to be uh, really cognizant of what's happening within their environment, within their communities, with their projects. Um, and these are long-term investments that organizations will be making in time, effort, um, and financially. Um, governance is really key. It's another area that we see. Um, some organizations, um, you know, have quite rightly set up, say, a an IPS, an Industrial Provenance Society, to do the project, ring fence the assets, and they've got a development arm. So there's another organization out there, same board, uh, who are out there chasing the funding, developing the project, and then selling it into the IPS. If there's no service level agreement between them and you haven't got that a relationship formally aligned, things can go sour. Um, we've unfortunately seen that once. And it's really important that you understand that um, uh, in terms of the development side, uh, there's, there's going to be costs associated with developing a project. Um, how are those borne by the, the entity that's going to own the project? Um, have you got that written down? You know, what are the payment structures? Have you disclosed that? to your investors and your share prospectors. So those are the, uh, in terms of governance, really important that the paperwork's in, uh, right, the policies are uh, in place, that you've got your risk uh, policies in place, your investment policies, and so on. Um, so lastly, because um, I think we touched it on the financial model, is the community engagement side. So. You know, do you have the authority to, to be representing your community? How have you engaged your community? Um, in fact, I'll move on to that in a second, cause, and I think you guys have covered that extensively today. Um, what we look for, this is not exhaustive, but just gives you an idea of what we, what we look for. Um, so we, we're quite unique in that, as a funder, we want to see the, the benefit um, filtering down to the community. Um, we're not prescriptive in what that looks like, but we do want to know, have you, done, have you made an assessment? Have you gone through your... Um, this, by the way, is a map of uh, social in index of multiple deprivation map. It, you can go online, it's free. You can punch in a postcode and it tells you um, your neighborhood, you know. Is it, uh, is it a wealthy area? Um, uh, what are the, the issues? Um, that's a separate uh, resource, but it sort of flags visually um, whether there's issues around fuel poverty for example um, social inclusion there's this it's quite a it's a rich database that makes up that map but it's it's quite in, uh, illustrative um, have you drilled into that do you understand why this area and this is a uh, a blue in this case, I think they changed the colors recently, um, is a wealthier area than say a red or a, a, a more yellowy type color. Why, what, what's that disparity about? What's particular to that uh, area? If your, project's in, if your project's in a nice uh, wealthy area, are you distributing the funds in the right place? You know, who you, who's, who's really benefiting from this? If you sort of, this is, a, this is Brighton and Hove. Um, if you sort of zoomed out and this was a rural community and it's a wind farm or a solar farm, you know, who, where are those benefits really flowing to? Is, it, um, is the wealthy farm owner getting wealthier out of this um, and the developer? Uh, or is that benefit being spread and where is it being spread? Being really clear about, um, you know, who's benefiting. Um, how am I doing for time? Three minutes. Three okay. Minutes. Um, practically there. So uh, some of the things we look for is, is the social mission embedded within the, the Articles of Association? So uh, if you're developing a project, the, 
uh, the articles sort of create a footprint for any work that's done. So if you've got a community fund, for example, so if it's a big project and it's kicking off profits and that's being ring-fenced by another entity, the spending of that fund is going to be um, uh, dictated or its ability to spend that money on particular projects is dictated by what the rules are in the, in the parent or the, the original funding vehicle. So if it's not in the, in the sort of the original uh, cooperative or community company, then um, there's going to be issues with how that's distributed later. So again, think back to the beginning. Um, how much of your surplus is going to go towards delivering social impact? Um, again, that's a particular condition of ours, but I think it's important for all projects. Um, how are you going to address that as an organisation? Where is that funding going? What's it going to be doing? Um, do you have a plan? Do you know what's, what's the life cycle of that? So um, have you identified local, or local charities, uh, local institutions that might be better, de you know, best place to actually deliver some of that, uh, say the NEA? Um, is that going to be a three-year funding cycle? Is that going to be over the 20-year lifespan of the project? Um, back to governance. Um, is this an uh, uh, ivory tower um, uh, exercise or is this, have you brought in people from the local community that understand these issues? So have you got someone from the NEA sitting on your board or in the funding uh, sort of the, the community fund, um, have you consulted them? How involved are they in the decision making when those funds are available for distribution? Or you're looking at you know, how you uh, maximize the benefit of, of the project. How have you uh, consulted and what is, what's the decision making process look like? Um, and as touched on previously as well is, okay, so all this, uh, these millions of pounds are sloshing around, who's actually monitoring what's happening to them? Where's the benefit going? How do you know that you're having a real impact on the ground? Um, I've sort of uh, skipped over the fact that for us, um, you know, renewable energy is, uh, uh, it's how we started out in terms of what we're doing as, as an organization, but ultimately it's, it's people on the ground who are really the beneficiaries of this. Um, and if we are to, to grow and scale up the sector, it's really going to come down to uh, how we've engaged people in, uh, in local communities, um, how we have been able to, to get buy-in um, for particular projects. So I'll leave you with this one, which is, uh, it's one of the projects we supported. It's in Camelford. Uh, so, not a wind turbine, this is a biomass project um, helping the leisure centre go off oil onto sustainable biomass. The local community came together, the local authority was going to close it. The community came together and said, look, we can run this. Uh, you're only going to close it because um, financially you couldn't make it work. We've got some ideas. We'd like to take it over. And they did. The biomass boiler was the difference between the project going ahead and not. It was it formed a fundamental part of the business plan. Um, through that, they've saved four jobs. Um, there's training uh, and development that happened with staff. Um, it's supporting countless kids uh, from primary schools in the area. Um, if without this facility, the swimming pool, um, many people wouldn't have any leisure facilities to, to use. Um, the nearest ones are you know, 20, 30 miles away. Um, this is for us what it's about. It's about being able to engage and really add value to those um, uh, that, that matter most. Thank you.